We're looking at The Mystery of Providence by John Flavel, one of the books for February. Got an outline there before you, just to kind of give us a easy guideline. Chapter one, he dealt with the work of providence. Well, he had an introduction first, and we'll look at that in a minute. He had the work of providence for the saints. He had a work of providence in chapter two, where he talks about in our birth and our upbringing. And then chapter three, in our work of conversion, God's providence. Chapter four, providence in our employment. Chapter five, providence in our family affairs. Chapter six, providence of God in the preservations of the saints from evil. Chapter seven, the providence of God in the work of sanctification. Chapter eight, the duty of meditation on providence. Chapter nine, how to meditate on the providence of God. Chapter 10, the advantages of meditating on providence. Chapter 11, practical implications for the saints. Chapter 12, practical problems in connection with providence. And then chapter 13, the advantages of recording our experiences of providence. And typical of how the Puritans worked, if you have it on Audible, you notice that most of the chapters are 20 to 30 minutes. Then you get to the application chapters and they're an hour and an hour and a half because he did lots of application. And some of the application is re repetitive and that's okay. We need that repetition. But uh, we're gonna be going through this. I want you to participate. Um, may I ask you some questions. Isaac's got a mic to give to whoever has a question or a comment. So that way the people that are streaming can hear as well and I don't have to repeat. Uh, what is said, because I might not repeat it right either. Um, so that's what we're going to do, and I'm happy for you to participate in this book study. It's a great book. I hope you did get a chance to read it. If you didn't, that you still will read it. It uh, really was a life changer for me as a young man to learn about the doctrine of providence. So we'll go to Psalm 57.2. We'll start off there where Flavel started, and then we'll just look at kind of a skimming outline of the book and a few lessons along the way. Psalm 57, two. I will cry unto God most high, unto God, that performeth all things for me. Thank you, Father, for your word and for the day that you have given to us to think upon your word, think upon your person, think upon your goodness and your, your greatness. And we pray, Father, that you would help us as we work through this outline of this book. Uh, we are thankful for Mr. Flavel, the work you accomplished through him and the benefit that he has left uh, many generations after him. And we ask, Lord, that you, would be, that you would be with us today to help us. Forgive our sins, Lord. Uh, take away all the impediments that would keep us from learning and growing and being strengthening in the most holy faith. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So he begins with Psalm 57, 2. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. And so he mentions here are two great things given to us first of all that the Lord is most high how great God is but then second how he humbles himself to do things for us he in fact he performs all things for us so he calls that the mystery which is why the title of the book the mystery of providence because God is so great and yet he condescends to help you as a young lady as a young man as an old lady as an old man oh, I'm not supposed to say old lady and uh, as, an, as a mature lady and as an old man um, to do for us. And that's how we need to view life. That's how you need to, to view your life. You need to, and as a young man, we have to learn how to look at life and understand it in light of God's rule over all the world and over every aspect of our life and start thinking in that way. So, uh, in this introduction, he talks about David hiding in the cave 
And now here he is, he's surrounded by Saul's men. Saul's chasing him all over the place, as we noted in the life of David. And he's in this cave, hiding out. And who comes to the cave but Saul himself? So it looks very dangerous, but actually he could have killed Saul. So there was the providence of God in that actually he was protected and hidden from Saul while he was in there. And there was also the providence, which David then had to make a decision upon, um, here is my enemy, I can kill him. And so he's going to lay down some rules for this along the way and the providence, how we read the providences of God, how we work with the providences of God. And so David right away shows us some of that in that here's the providence of God, how should David read it? So David's men read it in this way, kill him, he's your enemy, he's causing us all this trouble and you can take the kingship. David reads it as the word of God. The word of God says, touch not my anointed, do my prophets no harm. So that's how David proceeds. That's how he interprets providence because the word of God is always the interpreting body for the providence of God that keep us safe because providence is difficult for us to read at times. If we don't have that base, if we don't have uh, this body of knowledge which is going to help interpret for us all of our life and what God is doing around us. So he talks about um, the duty that we have to cry to God and to the God who performs all things for us, uh, that God is perfect and that God's work must be done and accomplished. He will emphasize prayer throughout this book that and at the very end of the book, he talks about the fact that you can't really benefit from providence except by prayer. If you're a prayerless person, you're not going to see it and you're not going to benefit from it. And other bad things are going to come through your heart and mind if you're not a person of prayer. So he, in his introduction, he just says, providence is that which undertakes for us and that which perfects us in the work that God has for us, um, even the providence of death. That's the final providence for us on this earth, which will finally perfect us in all things. He talks about in the scriptures, names given to preserve the providence of God. Bethel is mentioned three times, at least three or four times by, by uh, Jacob, house of God. That's the house of God. Pillars put up. This was the house of God. Uh, the children of Israel, when they're going across uh, the two and a half tribes on the other side, they set up a memorial. That's remembering the providence of God. So these things we do along the way, here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. Um, and what he mentions, uh, which I thought was very interesting, his, one of his views of heaven and his view of heaven is that he believes that in heaven all the providences of God which sweetly protected us and guided us and kept us all through our lives and, and were very strange and wonderful providences will be opened up to us in eternal glory so that we are able to uh, one day behold all the providences of God with wisdom and understanding, maybe part of what happens to us in the other world. Uh, which will bring much glory and honor, of course, um, to, to God. So, chapter 1. Chapter 1, he begins the work of providence for the saints and God's special care over the saints um, by, his, by his providences. So, and I, and I do want to open this up. I do want you, you if you want, would like to give, anybody want like to give some general observations that you have or ways in which this book has helped you um, in general, um, I'm open to that. Just raise your hand or blurt out to Pastor Mark. When we talk about the providence of God, he begins with God's special providence for the saints because God has a special providence for the saints. He has obviously the wonderful providence of bringing us redemption uh, by placing us in a place where we could hear the gospel message. And uh, not only that, 
but we see numerous instances throughout the scripture given to us over and over again of how God wonderfully kept the children of God um, throughout their lives. When we look at the book of Daniel, there's lots of things there that talk about the providences of God. We see children of Israel being deposited in a faraway land by the providence of God and because of the disobedience of the people. And what kind of providence is that? Well, it's a providence in which Daniel, who lives to a ripe old age, will be a governor in a pagan land for decades and underneath numerous em emperors in that land. And we can trace it all the way, I think, back to Daniel, why we have the Magi coming at the birth of Jesus Christ. Because Daniel was there and the Hebrew children were there and the manuscripts were there and the learning was there and it was left behind in that kingdom uh, that there would be a, an understanding of God's word and the prophecies of God so that at some point in time there are Magi who, who are reading these documents, see the star in the sky, and they understand a special event, the pivotal event of the whole world. So there are lots of providences that took place through empires as well. But the children of God, the children of God coming there, he talks about the three Hebrew children and how they were specially, providentially protected and kept in their diet, that, that they were given and in the fiery furnace as well. He talks about the children of Israel fleeing the Egyptians and that in the providence of God, it looked very bad for them. God puts them in a place in which they're trapped essentially. And also that his providence can be all the more marvelous in coming to their aid and coming to help them, which should teach us something. It should teach us that sometimes God's gonna put you in a trap and that the reason he's putting you in that trap in that way in which there's no other way out but to look to him. So that's, that's the ways of God. He talks about Jeroboam reaching out his hand against the man of God and that God withered it up so that he couldn't strike the man of God and how God's in his protects, how he protects his saints from evil because evil surrounds us. It is everywhere. If we meditate on that too much, we get a little bit scared in our hearts. If we listen to the news for too long before listening to the news, the good news. So that can be very frightening, but this doctrine of providence is something that gives us comfort and care and peace about all the crazy news that's going on around us in the world. We're th we should be thankful that we live on the other end of 6,000 years in which we have watched the revolutions of men come and go and God working in the midst of them so that our hearts don't have to fail for fear when we are in the midst of some sort of revolution as well. And as Flavel said, wicked men would swiftly destroy the believers on earth if God's special providence was not toward them because that is their aim, that is their goal, that is their desire. They have voiced it many times. We even have people with bumper stickers today that carry around with them that sentiment. You know, so many Christians, so few lions. And so I've seen the bumper sticker. That's their heart, that's their desire, the destruction of Christianity and all believers. And therefore, God's special providence is toward them. Just like we can see in the overall history of the, of the children of Israel, they had three great feasts. At those three great feasts, they, all the men had to leave their towns and villages, left behind the women and children, and went to the Passover, went to the Feast of Tabernacles, went to the three great feasts. They were commanded to do so. And they left the entire country uh, without protection. And throughout the whole history of Israel, even when it was in its wickedness, the enemy never came in during those times to destroy them. What is that but the providence of God uh, protecting his people? When I think of the providences of God, I think of the remarkable life of Joseph and reading the, the, book, the life of Joseph in Genesis. To read that life is to read providence, is to see providence. 
in a hundred different ways in Joseph's life, the difficulties of it and also the beauties of it as well. And as Flavel says, providence at times crosses its hands as Jacob did on Manasseh and Ephraim, that it's not understandable to us and yet it's very much what God intends to do. All right, so the works of providence towards the saints, towards the saints. Does anybody want to give a testimony of a special providence of the Lord that you can think of? I'm not giving you 30 minutes now, but I do want to hear from you if you want to give something that comes up into your mind as we talk about these things of God's special providence toward his saints, toward his saints. Do be thinking of it, okay? And maybe by the end, some of you will have some things or jot it down, or maybe some of these specific chapters will make you think of something as well. Chapter two was our birth and our upbringing. That we are wonderfully made by providence in the womb. That's the providence of God. And through the DNA, which we're just barely beginning to unravel some things, God creates us everything that we were are. And uh, Amy Carmichael, when she was growing up as a child, she wished she had blue eyes. She didn't want brown eyes. She wanted blue eyes because blue eyes were prettier. And she was not real happy with God with that. But in time, God called her to India. And over in India, nobody has blue eyes. And so therefore, she had brown eyes and brown hair so that she could intermix with the culture, eat more easily, especially in the work that she had in rescuing little girls from temple prostitution so that she wouldn't be noticed as well. God's providences are detailed and they are certain over all of our lives. Providence has placed you in the kind of home that you grew up. It may have been a dysfunctional, unbelieving home that he placed you in. And out of that, he showed forth great mercies to bring you out or into the freedom that there is in Jesus Christ he may have placed you in a godly home in which you had training coming up and therefore gave you a great advantage over most people because you had the advantage of having the word of God uh, before you and being brought to the, uh, the house of God as well. But providence does this in our upbringing. As Flavel says, God could have put any one of you into a Hindu home. He could have put you in an Islamic home. He could have put you in a place where there is no gospel and where the culture is entrenched completely in paganism and wickedness. And God can save even out of those things as well. But we can say, I think, in general, we see the great blessing of being raised and brought up in a Christian land, a land where the gospel can be easily heard. What a blessing that is uh, that we should recognize and be thankful Four, we are born by his providence to be on the stage of the world that is now. Of Esther, it was said, Mordecai said, who knows, but you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You are born now, you're on the stage now, you have a duty now, Esther. And God has placed you in this position near to the king as well. So Mordecai saw all this as the providence of God, the time, the placing, everything. God, should, we should see our lives that way too. God places us in a time. He places us in certain situations for such a time as this. Not to complain that I wish I was in a different situation, but to glorify God in the situation that he places us and puts us. For God has his agents, his saints, his witness, in lots of different places, and God puts them in strange places at times. I have shared with you in the past of a lady who was a mother superior on an island off of Great Britain, whom an air conditioning guy came over to work on their air conditioning, put in a new one, and she had told him they were praying for the money. He kind of scoffed at that in his mind because she was Catholic, he was Protestant. When he went over there, uh, after she told him God had provided, he saw that 
It was unusual. There were no crucifixes on the walls. There were none of those things that you would normally see in a nunnery. And come to find out, this woman years ago had been, by the providence of God, converted by an evangelist that came on the island. She had come to the position of Mother Superior, and she was teaching all the nuns the gospel of Jesus Christ. So strange, strange situations which we can't explain, and yet God has his people in lots of places. Birth and upbringing. The work of conversion. So this is, this is a wonderful chapter to think about on God's work of conversion. And one of the things he does, he begins with the uh, Ethiopian eunuch who is in a chariot and just happens to be reading Isaiah chapter 53 when uh, Philip is transported there to come up and to ask him, do you understand what you're reading? Well, no, I need somebody to help him. Well, wonder of wonders. He's reading the right chapter, and he's got a preacher right there to explain to him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he is converted. And so we can, we can and we should look back upon our lives and our conversions and the way that God worked in our lives to bring us out of a state of stupor, out of a state sometimes of of great enmity against God, sometimes just that kind of enmity which is just don't really care either way about God. Either way, it's enmity uh, of, of God, but how God brought us out of there. I know I was brought out of that. I, I had the high privilege of in a Christian home, Christian faith, Christian services all the time, and was just peacefully working my way toward hell uh, without receiving the gospel, and God in a service, under the means of grace, you know, came after me and opened up my heart to the gospel. Spurgeon was forced into a little church on a snowy day to hear a preacher who could hardly even put two words together, but who could say one scripture passage, which is, look unto me all the ends of the earth and be saved, and who was spoken to personally in that, in that uh, service. As the man looked back at Spurgeon on the back rows and said, young man, you look miserable. You need to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God used it. I remember at my college, Liberty College, Jerry Falwell used to talk about his own conversion that as a young man, he was a lazy young man and he wouldn't get up on Sundays. And after all, he, he refused to go to church with his mom on Sundays. But mom knew how lazy he was, so while he was in bed, she turned on the radio to a faithful gospel minister because she knew he was so lazy he wouldn't get up out of the bed to turn it off. And so he got to hear the message of the gospel over and over every Sunday uh, in the providence of God. I remember Brother Jim, do priest, his testimony, how he was in Vietnam and how he was required to go to every fire base. And so he would go in by a chopper into every fire base and he would be under fire going in. He was an unconverted man. And how God protected him and preserved him under fire through all these fire bases. And then in the providence of God, he got a sickness in which he was sent home to die, they told him. And, uh, and then when he was home in time, his wife, uh, who was a force to be reckoned with, had gone to church and came home and said, you need to come with me, and I'm not going. I, and, but with her womanly um, persuasion, she got him to come to church to hear Pharaoh Griswold preach. He said, I'll never go back and hear that man again, but he did the next week, and he was converted. So it was a train of providences and protections in his life to bring him to faith in Jesus Christ. So, you know, in our, in our own conversions and in our own lives, we can see the work of God and how God worked us uh, to that point to convert us. If you remember, Ben Gardner was held up at gunpoint, and that, that's what caused him to think about life, because he survived it and then said, if I'd have died, I'd have gone to hell right then. If he'd have pulled that trigger, that's all it would have taken. God uses lots of different things to bring us to faith in Christ. Chapter 4 is Providence in Employment. Employment. And uh, he said some you know, employments are, are used in different ways by the providence of God. I have noted in my own life and in the lives of others, there are some employments, 
jobs that are suited particularly to keep men or women from tem certain temptations, that hinder them from certain temptations, and that God in his grace gave them those employments in which uh, he was protecting and preserving them from, from sin. There are some employments that are very humbling employments. These are the ones we don't like as well and sometimes we'd like to get out of, but we find that when God puts us in those employments that humble our hearts, it's good for our hearts because we need humbling. I know that my own thought process, I, I was converted, but my thought process was I like to play sports and I want to play for the rest of my life. So I'm going to go to Liberty and I'm going to play football and I'm going to be a gym teacher. And that way for the rest of my life, I get to play. And uh, after the first semester, all that went to the wind and God called me to what I didn't ever think he would call me to. God keeps some poor in their employment to where they make ends meet, but they make ends meet and keeps them in that way. You know, for some of us who have daydreamed at some point in our life about winning the lottery, God has not damned us with that, which would have destroyed us. Others are given great riches. I think of Letourneau, the great engineer down in Texas, who became a very wealthy man uh, for his day. I think it was 1800s. And he learned the principle of tithing. He gave 10% to the Lord. And then as God increased his riches, he gave 20% and 30%. And after a while, he was a very wealthy man. And he was giving 90% of his wealth to the work of the gospel. He also built libraries all over the country, uh, did good, good things. But for, so for some men, he employs them and gives them great riches like Abraham. Other men he keeps poor, but that is, that is God's determination. Chapter five, family affairs, family affairs, providence, providence in marriage. He, he mentions Proverbs 9, 14, 19, a prudent wife is from the Lord. So the Lord in his providence uh, will give a spouse that is through time, we see the appropriateness of the spouse that God has placed us with for various reasons, to help us with our own walk with Christ. To, 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 for a man, we think in the terms of aiding us in our labors and in our work uh, in various ways, but there's things that we may not see at first. We, we get married and we love that person, but there's as we think about it, and that's what he says at the end of the book, you ought to think about these things, um, we realize the appropriateness of it. Children as well, being a providence from the Lord. When God gives children, um, they are a sanctifying effect upon the life, and they cause you to think about things. can't tell you how many people, with the first child especially, begin to think about life differently um, because of that first child and the responsibility that is given to them. Eleazar in the scriptures had an amazing providence as he goes to get a wife for uh, Isaac. The whole story of Rebekah is a wonderful story of providence, the providence of God and how God directly led them to the family that he wanted him to be a part of. We can say that with Jacob too. He met, he goes into the land and he meets Rachel right off uh, at the well. And uh, so the providence of God and in the family, too, um, the crews of oil to provide for the family. Provisions, as you have a family and you need provision, you find the Lord providing in different ways for that. And that's the providence of God. And, and we should rejoice in that uh, as well. When I was first married, went to a seminary, came back home. I had no gas for my car. I told my wife, Colleen, at that time, have no gas, won't be going to school tomorrow unless I get some money from the Lord. And we got an envelope in the mail from somebody who apologized for not giving us this money at the wedding, but that here it is. So I had money for gas for the next day. So we, we, we should note those little providences throughout our life and how the Lord has provided. Now, I remember one day uh, Elizabeth was needing a car and a man 
drove up, who I knew, in the driveway, had gotten a car for his daughter and wanted, wanted to know if it was okay if we could sell him, sell that car for a dollar to us. I said, yeah, we could use that. Elizabeth could use that. It's the providence of the Lord. The Lord does provide in lots of different ways. He, he takes care of us. Chapter 6, the preservation of the saints from temptation. Two ways, by internal grace, but what he wanted to talk about was by the external work of providence, by the external work of providence. There are lots of things that preserve us from temptation. There are lots of things that keep us from sin. They're hindrances. We know it, we have known it in our lives. Where we have been tempted, we were considering it, so we were already in sin actually, we were considering doing the thing that we know was wrong and something entered the scene which didn't make it possible to happen. That is certainly the sweet providence of God to restrain us and to keep us from doing uh, sin, rebellion against him. Sometimes he'll send a person to us. Sometimes he'll send a stranger to us to talk to us or to say something to us. He'll send a child to us to question us, question our hypocrisy that we weren't willing to turn loose until somebody came and talked to us about that. There's different ways in which the saints are preserved by the providence of God. Jonah was hindered by a storm. God sent him a storm to hinder him in his path of sin. Uh, the removal of Uriah, as Flavel talks about that fact, that how sometimes God in his providence removes a man from a situation. We talked about that when we looked at Uriah, whom David committed adultery with his wife and then killed Uriah, but his death took him out of a situation in which he would have had to deal with an adulterous wife and an unfaithful king. And who knows what he might have done? He was a great warrior. He might have sinned against the Lord. He might have killed David. So we don't know all that, but what we do know is that the scripture says that at times God removes the righteous from the scene in order for their own good. So what kind of evil pre prevented you, what kind of providence prevented you from evil? What kind of providence? A sudden phone call. You were thinking about something, you were gonna do something, your phone rang took you away from that, a knock at the door. Lots of different things can happen. Chapter 7, Providence and Sanctification. The providence of God in sanctification is, is quite, quite active and quite complete. Uh, our bodily illnesses sanctify us, so that providence comes upon us fairly often of bodily illness, not everyone. Some people have very, very good health their whole life. But for most of us, we have some sort of bodily illness or another, and this sanctifies us. God uses this to remind us of our mortality, of the judgment of God to come, of our need to draw near to God, uh, the loss of family members at times, a loss of a soul might draw us near to God in the providence of God, might sanctify us by this loss of a soul. All of our funerals are great reminders of sanctification to us to prepare for the final day, as well as the gaining of a soul, whether as we talked about the gaining of a child or of a spouse or a friend, that may also draw us near to God. <clears throat> the loss of all things like Job. And he suffered the loss of, of family and of wealth. This caused him to think through a lot of things. This caused him actually to argue with God for a while about various things. And then that was a preparation for God to say to him, Job, now, but where were you when I created all these things? I am the one who's in control. I am the one who, who will um, guide you in all these things. Isaac. <laughs> so uh, I was thinking of, of like uh, the story of uh, 
Richard Wormbrand in uh, Torture for Christ, and as well as his story, as well as the other uh, Christians who were, you know, imprisoned for their beliefs, and how God even used the horrible situations that they endured in prison to sanctify them, like, like they were beaten and tortured and whatnot, and yet God was able to use even that, and to just bring them closer to God, and to use their testimonies to, uh, and to save those around them who were unconverted. <laughs> and like, even now, I, with, uh, his book still in circulation, in circulation, and all the, uh, lives that, uh, Voice of the Martyrs has, have used to help those in need. And so I was thinking, like, how, how God even used that to, and for the conversion of souls and to sanctify those saints in those uh, horrible situations. And I'm sure he's even doing that now for saints who are still in similar situations. Yes, that, uh, and Lachlan, Lachlan said not to flip the switch, leave it, just leave it hot, and he'll take care of it back there. Um, yes, out of that prison experience came our awareness of persecution in a greater way through the voice of the martyrs and that sort of thing. Yes, Wormbrand said we had a we had a deal. They beat us, and we got to give them the gospel. And uh, but it is it's very comforting to know that even under the worst circumstances, God is using it for our good and can sanctify us even under the the harshest circumstances. Chapter eight: the duty of meditation on providence. Um, the, those that were in captivity for those 70 years, they were commanded by God to meditate upon him. Psalm, look at a, a few verses real quick here. Psalm 77, a few verses in the book of Psalms. Psalm 77. In verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. So we have the benefit of not only remembering our own providences in our own life, but the, what God has done with others as well. Psalm 78 in verse 35, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God was their redeemer. And then Psalm 143, 143, in verse 5, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. So we have a duty. That is a duty. And we are to do it before it's too late. You remember what God said to the man who was in hell. And he, he talks to him and says, remember, remember. Remember. That at one point, you had this, and he had that. Lazarus was, was poor and sick, and you had everything you, and now consider what has happened to you. So we want to remember and meditate on God and his goodness before it's too late. We don't want to be doing our remembrances with regret in hell. We are to remember the providences of God to help us and we do that in prayer as well. Chapter 9, how to meditate on providence. He said we need to labor to get a full, thorough understanding of the providence of God. Do actual some meditation, some thinking about it, some delving into it so that we can think about the details of it, searching back into our lives, thinking about the times, how suitable the times were, how suitable it was at the particular time that God's providence, he did this or that, how suitable the instruments were that he used uh, to help us, sometimes how unusual the instruments were that he used to help us. Meditate much on providences which humble us um, and make best use of these sorrowful, sometimes dark providences as Joseph did when he said, God meant it, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He had thought about those things. Remember that your God's providence is bringing this world to a good end. That's the big picture of providence, that we should meditate on the fact that God is, 
history is not secular, but it is linear, and he's bringing it to a, a, a good end. Chapter 10, the advantages of meditation on God's providence. Um, we are to be made glad by the words of God. Meditation on the providences of God. The advantage is, is that this is fellowship with God. It is fellowship to meditate like this and to think about the providences of God. Habakkuk said, I'll wait upon my tower and see what God answers me, how he's going to reprove me. He'd been thinking about the providences of God and the Chaldeans coming to wipe Israel out, but he knew that if he thought about it and waited, God would say something to him and talk to him, and he did. The famous verse, the just live by faith. He says there's an advantage to building up these stones of remembrance because it's a building of our faith. Um, if you will meditate on the providences on a regular basis, this builds the faith. It makes it easier when new providences come along or dark providences come along to be able to be strong in the faith because you've already built up this wall of providences in the past that you have. He said, meditate on God's providence toward his enemies. See how he does good to his enemies. If God does good to his enemies, what in the world will he do for you? He, he does all good toward us, Romans 8, 28. Chapter 11 was the practical implications. So a practical implications of meditating upon the providences of God and thinking about the mystery of providence is we must own God in every providence. We must own the fact that God has brought this about. Whether it's our own internal being, um, aspects of our own personality or our body or whatever, God brought that about or our circumstances. And we should see it. The closer we can see it to every detail of life, the better off we will be, the more holy we will be, the more glor God glorifying we will be so that in every single providence, we, and you've seen some people like that and from time to time, perhaps they've surprised you or delighted you and that they openly are acknowledging all the time the providence of God, that God is in everything that happens in their life. And, and it's not just words. That's how they live. That's how they live. And as God always works in your behalf, so then should you always work in God's behalf is a takeaway. Chapter 12, practical problems under God's providence, discovering God's will under doubtful, difficult, dark providences. There's the revealed will of God and the secret will of God. We follow the providence of, of God as far as it is our understanding of it. We interpret it as far as it is consistent with the word of God, always interpreting it by the word of God. And understand this, that there are promises in the word of God that sometimes take years to be fulfilled. There's timing involved in some, but others are involved in just a like progressive sanctification. It's just a lifetime process. And sometimes God leaves the enemies with you, which he does with our sinful nature, because the sinful nature is not eradicated until glory. He leaves the enemies with you so that you will learn to trust in God and learn to war the warfare of God in his providence. But he says, don't let providence alienate you from God. I have seen that happen. Uh, I've seen it happen, especially with a child dying in a family, and then um, they got upset with God. And some turned away from God for a good while. Um, thankfully, some have returned. The advantages of recording our providence is that's a great thing to do if you'll have the discipline to do it. Write in a book what God has done. I wish my parents you know, had done lots of different things. Um, and it's something we could leave to those who come behind us. Uh, it, it would be a wonderful thing. I have done it hit and a miss. I've got it here and there. I haven't been as disciplined as I should with it, but it is an excellent thing. All right, any other comments before we finish up here that you have or thoughts before we finish out? Connie.
78. What was that verse? Thank you. Okay. There we go. The easiest question Connie has ever asked me. All right, Robert. On page 68 of the smaller version of the book, item four says, um, think of the special advantages of a will that is brought into the line of God's will, uh, brought in line with God's will. There's a deep contentment, a kind of Sabbath or sense of rest in the spirit of a man who fully accepts the will of God for his mm -hmm. life. I, yeah. That really spoke to me. Yes. I, th I thought of, like you, you talked about Joseph. Um, he didn't, I don't remember him talking about Joseph in there. He, he's talking about Abraham right before that. But, but you know, Joseph is, is certainly a, a challenge to, to me to, to accept the will of God and, and you know, the, the way God basically blessed him for, for not, bowing up and, and right. becoming bitter at, at the things that God brought into his life. Yes, thank you. Yeah, contentment, that's our Sabbath. Thank you, Father, for uh, the time we've had in this book. We pray that you would help us to ever and always be content with thy will upon our lives and recognize it that we might rest with thee. We pray in Christ's name, amen.